I'm Michael Parkinson. I'm the chair for today. I want to say two things. We're not expecting a fire alarm, so if you hear one, please just go call me out that door. That's that done. Uh, and it's now my pleasure to invite to the stage to open our conference the Vice Chancellor of the University of Liverpool, Professor Dame Janet Beer. Can you please welcome her? Thank you. Can I add my welcome to, to Michael's? Uh, it's great to see so many of you here. I'm very happy to hear there'll be no fire alarm because I understand those of you staying at Hope Street had a bit of practice last night. So um, congratulations on being here following that interrupted sleep. Um, our conference today, Liverpool 2025, using our city regional knowledge assets to drive inclusive growth. Um, this is the largest audience that we've had in the series of events which the Hesseltine Institute has organised in, in recent years. And I think it's clear why. Um, that combination of um, knowledge assets driving inclusive growth. We have in the past discussed variously uh, European, Liverpool City region, and also Lord Hesseltine's contribution to the nation and to Liverpool. Um, they've been very successful conferences. Um, and actually, for me and my colleagues here at the university, what they do is they confirm our convening power. This is what universities are for. Convening power on the key issues facing our city, region, and indeed the nation. And the issues we are going to discuss today are crucial for the nation as well as for our city, region. Um, so all these matters are close to our hearts here at the University of Liverpool, as we work hand in hand with the city, with the city region. And what I just want to do very briefly is spell out our ambitions for the day, what we're doing and why. Um, Michael's going to talk to you about how. So why are we doing it now? Liverpool is in the middle of an extraordinary, continuing renaissance. In the past decades, it's made huge economic strides, although of course, it has further to go. Um, right at the heart of the city region, Knowledge Quarter Liverpool is on a, a very exciting development path with a billion already invested and a further billion in the pipeline. Through its universities, its hospitals, research institutions, cultural institutions, high-tech firms, and the city council, we want to build on this investment and development. And given this trajectory, um, we feel that this is a moment of opportunity. Uh, now is the time to look ahead to Liverpool 2025 and ask what should be our ambitions for Knowledge Quarter Liverpool and for the city region around it. So we're going to celebrate achievements so far, but also lay down some challenges for the next period. We want the conference to focus, as I've already said, on both growth and inclusion. And growth in the Knowledge Quarter Liverpool area is crucial. Um, high, value at, high value added jobs and businesses are critical not only to Liverpool but to the wider city region. And whilst KQL is a physical space, um, we think that it has, an it has a kind of symbolic role as well at the heart of the city um, and a city region wide innovation system. We believe that it will help drive the economic renaissance of the Liverpool city region. And we have many growth issues to address as we attempt to commercialize our knowledge assets to spin out companies and attract continuing investment. But you will also know that Liverpool still has many, many inclusion issues to address. And we want the knowledge quarter to be a different kind of growth project. We want it to bring as many benefits to as many people and places as possible. Um, we want it to provide opportunities for the surrounding communities. And inclusive growth is very much a stated ambition of our city and our city region leaders. And at the university, we, we share and support their ambitions. So we've asked our distinguished contributors this morning from the city region, from elsewhere in the UK and from beyond to help us find some answers to the following questions. How can we make sure that Liverpool builds on recent progress and that as many places and people as possible benefit from the development and investment? 
What are the key policy and philosophical issues in harnessing innovation and knowledge to achieve inclusive growth in our city? What is UK government doing to encourage the process? Which city regions, including Liverpool, are doing what, where, with what success, nationally and internationally? And what are the policy messages and future challenges for the city region, for government and for our partners? And this is a significant set of questions. We're not going to arrive at the answers in a single morning, but we feel that this is enabling us to make a good start. Um, we can help to set an inclusive growth agenda for Knowledge Quarter Liverpool and the city region um, with 2025, the first date in our sites. And I'm really looking forward to hearing the conversations that go on this morning. So Michael will now tell us as conference chair more of the detail about how we're going to do this. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Vice Chancellor. Can I also add uh, my welcome to everyone here today? I mean, we are drowning in success, quite frankly, and we have many more people coming. We're standing in Germany. Um, this is one of the most successful events we've ever had, as Janet has already said, but there's a price to pay for success. Um, we have a very large audience. We have a very large, distinguished collection of speakers. We have a very important set of questions to tackle. And we have very little time. So um, it's a problem for me to make sure everyone gets a fair go. We're able to do more than scratch the surface of the issues. And we end up somewhere near on time at 1.15. That's not going to be easy. So I'm going to have to be very firm. Um, you'll have to be a little bit patient. We are going to have opportunity for conversations and questions. We want this to be fairly open and fair. And the speakers will have to be very efficient. They've all said 10 minutes and no more. Thank you. Um, as the Vice Chancellor said, Liverpool is having a tremendous renaissance. The knowledge quarter is at the heart of that, driving it. Um, we want to start the conversation today. Uh, we want to celebrate, we want to reflect, we want to challenge. And at the end of the day or the morning, I think we'd like the knowledge quarter board and the team, including the Chief Executive uh, Colin Sinclair, to get a fairly clear idea of how a significant audience thinks <coughs> it is doing thinks what the key issues are, and thinks what might be the future priority. So in a sense, the board and team will be listening to your voices today. Um, like all is divided into four parts. Um, in the first part, we're going to have a, a discussion of, sort of the, the philosophical and policy issues involved in all this. We tend to assume we all know what innovation is, or knowledge is, or inclusive growth is. When you look, it ain't that easy. So I think before we get into the, the, the practicalities, we want to talk about what is involved. And for that, we're going to have some very serious colleagues. The second part, uh, Liverpool is a global city. We don't only look at what we do, we look at what others do, not to copy, but to learn from and to challenge ourselves. So in the second session, we'll look at what is going on in other cities, in other countries, in the UK, in Europe, and beyond. After a coffee break, um, we'll turn to the question of how Liverpool itself is doing. As I said, we've had a terrific renaissance, incomplete, as the Vice Chancellor said. We want to look at what are the ambitions and the achievements for Knowledge Quarter Liverpool. We're going to talk about many things today, but I do want to try and bring us back to this particular initiative in this particular place and how it can contribute to the city and, importantly, the city region agenda. As the Vice Chancellor said, Knowledge Quarter is at the <coughs> centre of the Eco Hub, which runs, frankly, um, from Port Sunlight over there to Darsbury over there. This is the heart of it, but it does connect. And in our final session, we'll ask some distinguished colleagues from the City Council, the City Region, the University, to reflect on what they've learned, what they've heard, and as someone said last night, what they haven't heard, and cut, pull out some, some key messages. So we've got top academics, we've got senior top policymakers from this country uh, and beyond. Some will be PowerPoint presentations, others will simply talk. They'll all try and speak for 20 minutes. I'm very much hoping that at the end of each session we'll have a quarter of an hour or so where you can make comments or questions. And it's a frank, full family debate. Keep it civilized, but do keep it robust. Um, and I know that's a bit of a rush. So without more ado from me, I'd like to ask the panelists 
from our first session to join me here. So they know who they are, but it is Professor Louise Kenny, Colin Sinclair, uh, Professor Dame Henrietta Moore, and Joe Manning. The theme of this is what are the policy and philosophical challenges and opportunities? And opportunity is a big theme for us. Um, different colleagues are going to talk about that. Um, Colin Sinclair is Chief Executive Arts Court in Scientech. He's in charge of the business. Professor Dame Henrietta Moore is one of the leading thinkers on what growth and innovation really means, particularly for um, excluded communities. Joe Manning is very much in charge of leading um, this debate about industrial strategy, innovation, responsibility for the university region. It will be their turn in due course. But I'd like to start with uh, Professor Louise Kenny, who is Executive Pro Vice Chancellor for the Faculty of Health and Health Sciences. Please, Louise, the floor is yours. Thanks, Michael. Um, so I've got the challenge. Um, I'm talking about some of the philosophical and actual challenges that we face in the health arena in the city. And I've got 10 minutes to do that. Uh, and I want to finish on some of the potential opportunities that they present. And anyone who's familiar with the local health economy of Liverpool will know that we could talk about challenges for a week. We could have a whole week-long residential conference on that alone. So um, this is going to be very high level and very superficial, but hopefully we'll give you some food for thought uh, for the discussion. So I'm going to start with um, a snapshot of what the health of our city and our city region is like in 2019, and I'm going to finish with where I hope we will be in 2025 and beyond. Um, and this is a very data-driven presentation. So we know because of our uh, colleagues in uh, Liverpool uh, City Council Public Health Department, we've got very good data on, on our current health. And we have significant problems. And worryingly, some of the indices are going in the wrong direction. So if you look at some of the big hallmarks of, of city health, we have a premature death rate. So premature death rate of over 100 per 100,000, which compares very unfavourably with the national average. Um, and we've gone beyond just talking about crude morbidity and mortality now. We'd like to talk about healthy life expectancy. That sort of life added to years rather than years added to your life. And that's really important because um, a healthy population is really bad from an economic perspective as well as from a, a cultural and uh, an environmental perspective. And we've got a really unhealthy population with massive differences in healthy life expectancy, both men and women in our city and our city region compared to the national average. And that gap seems to be getting bigger rather than smaller. <coughs> One of the crudest um, indices of health is infant mortality. Uh, we often talk about low resource settings across the world in terms of their infant mortality. It's one of the first things that starts to improve when economies go up, and it's one of the first things that goes down when there are economic downturns. And anyone who saw the papers yesterday will know that the latest statistics show that the national trend for infant mortality is increasing. Infant mortality is increasing for the third consecutive year. So this is a national problem for us at the moment. But Liverpool, as ever, is at the sharp end of that. Our indices across uh, neonatal, perinatal, postnatal and infant mortality are all significantly greater than the national, the national norm. And if you look at the trends, the gap is opening up in Liverpool. Our infant mortality is going up at an exponential rate compared to the national average. And also compared with other northern cities at a time of austerity. So there is, there is something particularly challenging about the Liverpool region. This was an article in um, the uh, Guardian yesterday by Martin McKee, who's a professor of European uh, health policy. Uh, Martin writes quite movingly around about austerity and how, is it, how is it, it's bitten into our health indices. But actually, this article um, goes a bit deeper than that and says that you can't just explain it from austerity alone. There was something else operating around infant health. And the reason why it's important is that infant health will determine the health of this generation for the next 40 or 50 years. So by not acting now, we're actually just storing up problems year on year for the next four, five, six decades. And one thing that bothers me enormously as someone that was born and raised in this city, and I came to a doctor in the city and have worked here, is that this isn't fair. It's not a shared challenge. The inequity is massive. And this is um, uh, 
a snapshot from the June North report that was written by Ben Barr and colleagues in our public health department in 2014. This report was incredibly important in having some of the Lansley reforms uh, reversed. But it shows the, the massive uh, health discrepancy, <coughs> inequality in health across the Mersey Rail network, where you can see that uh, 10 minutes on the train from one postcode to another means 10 fewer uh, years of life expectancy. So that is a massive health inequality. And we've got some additional challenges in Liverpool. Um, the Liverpool City Region Health Economy um, has a population that is currently served by two large acute trusts that are currently in the middle of a, a complex merger and six smaller non-specialist acute trusts which provide tertiary care. This is Lord Cohen of Birkenhead. Uh, we have uh, buildings on our campus named after Lord Cohen. He was one of the forefathers and architects of the NHS. He worked very closely with his colleague Nye Bevan to design a, a socialist healthcare system. And it was his passionate belief that good care was given in small bijou hospitals, which is why the original NHS was set up with lots and lots of very small hospitals. Of course, in the early 80s, we realised that, that actually wasn't true and that good care was probably given in, in larger hospitals or in federated health systems. And that's what happened in the UK in the 80s and 90s. Largely, large, large uh, conurbations moved to a more integrated health economy. But in the 80s, Liverpool was on fire, literally. And we lost a decade, um, a decade of merger and greater planning around the health economy was really lost to us. So uniquely, we still have a very distributed uh, and very fragmented health economy with six smaller specialist trusts providing tertiary care. And why that matters is that our acute trusts will always be in deficit. They will never be able to provide profitable specialist services whilst they're bedded in, in specialist trusts. And because these trusts are also geographically very distributed, our population receive fragmented care in a very distributed system. And it is almost like the elephant in the room that no one really wants to acknowledge. For us as a university, it's been really challenging to establish an academic health science model when a lot of the specialist services that would really be of academic interest are not on campus. And why does that matter? Well, we know that academic health science centres based uh, on multiple modelling from all across the world and in the UK based on the NIHR Biomedical Research Centre model have been proven time and again to be the best model in which to integrate teaching, research and the delivery of clinical care. And put simply, patients that take part in research in this model um, have lower mortality rates and better outcomes. A paper that was published in one of the BMJ um, journals two years ago show that the mortality rate for patients that take part in research in hospitals that do research is 30% lower than for those that don't. So we are denying a population that already has, has massive unmet health needs the benefit of that by failing to deliver an academic health science model. And that really is partly on our rap sheet as a university. It's difficult to deliver this, but not impossible. And I think some time ago, the university just put this on the too hard to do list. Um, but that's going to change, and now I'd like to talk about the positives and some of the things that we're planning to do over the next little while. We are currently in the middle of a, a large and ambitious restructuring, reorganisation of the faculty, and part of that is because we are a civic university and we have a responsibility to the citizens of this city. And that responsibility is increasingly urgent, given the data that I've just showed you. Um, and we really do want to work in partnership to to, to change the political and social landscape for the better of our uh, better health of our citizens. We firmly believe in our faculty that we can lead the people of Liverpool out of ill health, but we have to make them part of this solution. And I'd like to give two very brief <coughs> illustrative examples of what we can do when we work together. <coughs> One of which programs is around joining the dots of 21st century discovery. So Speak, as many people will know, is home to a large concentration of industrial pharma who have big, significant manufacturing plants in the northwest. We've also got one of the oldest and most highly rated departments of clinical pharmacology and, right next door, one of the best chemistry departments in the country. And we also have an illustrious track record in global health and particularly in infectious diseases research. So you'd think that if you could just join up those dots, we'd have a real powerhouse of AMR research. But we haven't. We've been really sort of absent without leave from this for the last decade. And we have, we're actually on the sharp end of the looming AMR disaster with a health ecosystem that contains every kind of clinical setting uh, and a world-class clinical trial unit. We really can deliver big here. But as I say, until now, because we haven't had an, an academic health science model in which to deliver this, we haven't joined up the dots. Happily, 
uh, thanks to the um, auspices of Liverpool Health Partners and this roadmap that I've alluded to, we're now making big inroads. And this yesterday was a press release from NIHR of a 3.54 million boost for our AMR research, which will become the backbone of our BRC uh, when we go into that competition next year. This is a massive opportunity. If we just join up these dots, we can be absolutely the powerhouse of AMR research nationally. All the key ingredients are right on our doorstep. And a second example, which I'm only going to touch on briefly because um, one of the panel guests this afternoon uh, is, is leading on this initiative for us, <coughs> Professor Ian Buckham. If data is the new oil, then we think that Liverpool can be the new Texas. We've got 1.2 million people living in our city environs and ultimately 3.6 million up and down the coastal areas adjacent to our city. And if we link them in a civic data trust, we'll have a holistically linked population, similar in size and scale to Scandinavian countries or, for example, Israel, but critically with a very high incidence of the disease that industry are interested in. We need to bring the people of Liverpool into that trust with us, not just um, philosophically, not just physically into the trust, but also philosophically into the trust. They have to be part of this solution. But that will enable our city to commoditize our data, our health data and our civic data, for the benefit of themselves, but also critically for the next generation. This will be a unique um, digital kitchen in which large companies can come and model within our, our population. So they're just two very brief examples of the potential that we think we have. Um, to really change the narrative, the dialogue and the potential for the health of this city. As I say, 10 minutes is far too brief, but I did keep to time, um, Michael, <laughs> and I'd be happy to talk about other examples in the panel session. Thank you. No pressure, no pressure, uh, no presentation, no video, no CGI's. Um, what we're going to talk about. Well, it's been, it started with a chat with Michael. And it's been three years now. It's been three years since we got together our small band with Sally and, and Trish and, and you recruit over here, Rachel, and the Liverpool Science Park team. It's been three years since we started a journey to try and create some kind of transformational change in Liverpool. Um, and we started that journey with a feeling of enormous optimism. And if you look at Liverpool, the leadership in Liverpool, the assets in Liverpool, the global brand of Liverpool, there's probably no better place in the whole of the country for opportunity. This is the city, and I often say this, this is the city with the greatest, well, there we are, that's going to this is <laughs> this the right session, <laughs> I was worried about renaming it. This, this is a city with the greatest opportunity, thank you, Michael, in the country. But as Louise has just pointed out, we've, we've got some problems. And do you want something, Michael? I'm not trying to interrupt the reference. No worries. This is all, this is all extra time on my 10 minutes. And I don't know who the away fans were that set off the hotel alarm at 5 in the morning, but we've, it's a dirty trick, that, isn't it, the man's up. So it's been, it's been three years, you know, I think we've done a lot through what we've always called disruptive collaboration, you know, challenging the norm, never accepting anything average, only doing what's world class. And some phenomenal things, um, Paddington Village and the cities were there just being one example of transformational change in just a few years. But as Louise has pointed out, we've got some real challenges. And so what we've been discussing is, for all of us, for everybody in this room, this is a moment in time. If you look at the work of people like the Brookings Institute in America and all the writings on inclusive growth, sustainable inclusive growth, you'll realize that most post-industrialized cities have failed in their regeneration to create a truly inclusive society. And many great cities have successfully regenerated, but have left huge pockets of society behind. And they haven't solved the issues of health outcomes. They haven't solved the issues of child poverty. They've not dealt with drug abuse, knife crime, and all of the other issues in society. So we're, about, we're on this journey now. We're about to start this incredible journey of exponential growth in Liverpool. So this is our moment in time to not only build a city in the city region, 
but to start to transform the outcomes for the people who live and work and study here. This is a moment in time to do it, so given that I'm now, I've, I've got to try and get this done before I'm running to extra time, I'm going to very quickly set the scene for today by talking about why are we doing it, how are we doing it, and when are we doing it. Well, I've got a theory, and, and economists in the room might disagree, but I don't really think that this concept of trickle-down effect works. I think you, if you regenerate a city, and we're regenerating our great city and making such a success of it, can we be absolutely confident that that wealth and prosperity we create will impact on everybody's lives? I think if we're really honest with ourselves, the answer's probably not. Which means we've got to think about how we grow the city using the knowledge economy, using the endeavours of everybody in this room to really create that change and that fairness for all. So how are we going to do that? Well, there's no, clearly there's no single fix. And there is no doubt that setting policy and delivering policy locally has huge advantage to it. And that devolution is clearly at the heart of fixing so many of these problems. But I wouldn't rule out another concept as well, and it's something which I think Joe Manning will talk about later, which is this concept of co-production. Well, I think we can do, and I know the city already work closely with government, and I think we can do more with government whilst pushing hard on our devolution agenda. And the reason I say that is we, are, we have to intervene to get things right. But it's not about parachuting people in and doing lots of pilots and lots of short schemes where we kind of get tired because it doesn't really work straight away or that, oh, that budget's run out, let's move on, or those people change job. I think we've got to intervene in a very long-term way. And why I was very keen on the idea of doing today with Michael, I think we have to harness the power of the universities and the Heseltine Institute within the university to create an evidential base. It's really important. If we know the quantum of our problems now, then the work that we all do going forward, what, what that means is we know if it's working. And if it's not working, we don't give up because we've got the evidential base and we realize it might take a bit longer to fix all of these hugely complicated internal problems. And there's another point as well. There's this concept that was introduced to me last night at the dinner. So everybody spoke at the dinner. Don't worry, I've copied all your ideas. Somebody talked about change makers. And I really like that idea because I'm, I was trying to think, all, out of all the people in this room, I know so many of you are change makers. When I started doing this full-time life in Liverpool three years ago, I met lots of people who not only helped along the way, but those are the people I could tell that genuinely cared about changing the city and society. So we need to identify those change makers and empower them and encourage them because this has to be a collective piece of responsibility. So um, just to finalise really, and, and this, do, this is about setting the scene for today. I think we need some long-term programs. I think we need to recognise that there is no one fix. I think we can use the knowledge economy, the universities, and all of the efforts of the city, the city region, business, the third sector to drive this forward. It's a collective responsibility. And we need to focus on schools. We've got to get it right from the very beginning. And even before children go to school, we need to focus on housing, aspirational housing that rebuilds communities and empowers communities rather than just disperses people further out. It's no good building the most amazing scheme ever at Paddington Village if we just gentrify Kensington and move everybody to the next area. So we've got to create the aspirational housing in those areas so that people stay and take uh, uh, as their lives progress. We've got to use technology. We're a world leader in innovation district, so if we can't use technology, 
who can that's got to be at the front of it we've got to recognize that people don't have jobs for life anymore and that we need to really work on the flexible skills that people will need for lives with many many career changes in future through their life and it's something that mayor anderson said the other day when you know, these terrible homophobic attacks in Liverpool. We, we really need to work on the values. We need to create a society where, whether there are families or not families, where there are role models, and that we can get values there in society. And that comes through education, and very early years education. And in doing all of that, we've got to get resource. So, now there's certainly the relationship here between the city, the city region and, and government is absolutely critical. There has to be a link between austerity and some of the problems that we are seeing rise in society in terms of things like rice crime, race, uh, knife crime, racism, homophobia, gambling addiction. We cannot continue in a regime of austerity. We've got to invest to improve. Now, when are we going to do this by? <laughs> well, um, I, we call this Liverpool 2025. And we call it that because we need to do it now. Um, with, who knows what will happen with Brexit, but I'm absolutely confident <coughs> in one thing. If the UK economy continues to grow, then Liverpool will be the fastest growing city in the UK. So if we do this now, <coughs> In effect, we're using the dividend of our success to drive our change. So that's it for me. You've got some brilliant people to follow. I think I call <coughs> Michael and the team for producing a fantastic event to get some good speakers. We, the plan after today is to take this away and decide how we're all going to act on this collectively and make this change. So um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, see you all later. So can you please welcome Professor Dame Henrietta Moore. Oh, well, good morning, everyone. First of all, thank you so much for inviting me to be with you today, and I'm delighted to be here. Um, my job really is to think about how innovation can lead to sustainable prosperity for all in the UK. And this is not a very easy task. Now, one of the positive things I would like to begin with is that we do begin to see a shift in conversation, and we really heard it at the dinner table last night. People's ideas are moving in a new way. But we still have a major problem, and that is we are not moving our thinking about the economy fast enough, and we're not moving it far enough. So, for example, when we think about innovation and inclusive growth, both of those things can be challenged. Most often, innovation is not very innovative, and second of all, in inclusive growth is not very inclusive. <laughs> and as a nation, both innovation and inclusive growth are seriously uh, under-theorized and under-explored. So most people don't really know what we mean by inclusive growth. And if you don't know what it means, it's very hard to do it. Now, one of the things that inclusive growth often means is, oh my goodness, we were all having fun, but other people somehow got left behind. So we do need more growth, so let's have more growth, but let's try to include people. So it's growth first, inclusion later. And this is the first mistake. You need to begin with inclusion first and growth later. Because otherwise you don't get inclusive growth. What you get is inclusive markets. And there is no change in that market structure, so there is no radical transformation. So basically you're making incremental change which will not deliver what you want to see. Now, we know that trickle-down doesn't work. We also know that it's extraordinary that our best economists have known that for 50 years, real wages have been declining in the United Kingdom, and they have not once changed their economic model. Not once. Not once said anything about it. And that is quite remarkable in itself. So what's happening here about the way we think about things? And this is why the role of the university is so incredibly important. Yes, we've got high employment in the UK. We're always being told that every day of the week. But basically, we're a low-growth, low-productivity, sweatshop economy with lots of immiseration, and it's increasing. So we're not going in the right direction. Inequality, inequality costs the UK about £39 billion a year. 
and there's been a huge jump in working poor since the 1990s. And we've got 15 million people with long-term health conditions, as we've just heard, and Liverpool is suffering from that. So yes, in the industrial strategy that the government has just put forward, there is talk about the left behind, there's talk about a place-based approach, there's talk about how do we direct industrial strategies, strategies towards the main challenges of the day. But let's bear in mind that this is talk. It's not necessarily the kind of action we need to see. So, so cities are the place where that action is going to take place. Think about what, how bad this talk problem is. So two weeks after our government declared a climate emergency, they announced that they're going to increase that on domestic solar installations from 5% to 20%, right? So how is this going to help make that move? How is that going to help, right? So when we start to think about these things, we need to recognize that we need to focus our work on people's quality of life and how will that be delivered, the improvement in their quality of life. Now, inequality is a major scourge for countries all around the world. And the problem is that it operates at a very local scale. So we've been talking a lot in the past, and I actually really appreciate the conversation that took place at dinner last night, and I'm so sorry that the rest of you couldn't have been at dinner with us, but next time. <laughs> but the, um, is that it's not just about differences between regions, it's differences within the region. So in the four big cities of the UK, adjacent boroughs have health outcomes that vary between 3 and 25%. So you can live two streets away from people who have 25% better, worse off rather, than your health outcome itself. So what we need to do, first of all, is to think about how we model our economies at the local scale. We have the data mechanisms now to do this. We can do this. But we haven't done it. So one of the things is we need to work at this granular level. And when you work at a granular level, the first thing that happens is it changes your idea of what an economic policy is. Because it's not GDP growth for the country. It can't be something else, right? So what is that economic policy? It alters your view of, of appropriate policy intervention immediately. It changes your idea about what it is, what area is it that an economic strategy applies to, for example. And ultimately, it changes your idea about what an economic strategy is, because it's operating in a different way. So what we've done in the Institute for Global Prosperity is to develop the UK's first citizen-led prosperity index. That's people themselves saying where they want to go and how. We've done this with many colleagues, but particularly uh, Emma Frost from the LLDC, who will be talking to you later this morning. Now, five boroughs in East London are running experiments in how we can use this prosperity index to deliver local livelihoods and locally delivered industrial strategies in the next phase. And we will begin to run out the prosperity index in other places in the UK, starting in Wales in the autumn. So if you in Liverpool would like to be involved, we would be thrilled. So that's one way of thinking about how can we govern differently. Now, we need to think about economic innovation, as I've suggested, but we also need to think about social innovation. So when we talk about innovation, are we innovating for the most marginalized? Are we innovating for the biggest societal challenges in the areas in which we're operating? Have we got this innovation properly targeted? Have we really thought about who's the innovator? So very often, and um, as a member of a university and a professor, I accept this criticism. Certainly in the past, universities thought about innovation as happening, something that all lots of very clever professors and other people did. But actually innovation, particularly social innovation, has to be a collaborative exercise, and it has to start with people themselves. And it has to lead back towards research excellence and the top end of science and technology. It cannot necessarily begin there. That process, that virtuous circle, has to be maintained, and it needs to be speeded up. So in the IGP, we use citizen scientists in all our research projects. They're on the research project. They help define the research problem. They help deliver the data collection, the data analytics, and the impact which follows from that. And that's important because it means that as that impact drives through into the area where you work, these are people who've already been on the research team. So they become the people, along with other members of the community, who are using the data that's been collected to check whether you're on the pathway to prosperity or not becomes a way of, of engagement which flows outwards, shall we say. Now, when we think about social innovation, one of the difficulties we have is that we can't just think as we are now. 
about social innovation. We have to think into the future. In other words, we have to think ex ante. So what are we going to, what's going to happen with what's coming? So what's coming is another series of massive structural transformations in the economy. And when we think about innovation, social innovation, we don't think about what do we need to do to make sure that we're developing people's capacities and capabilities to manage through the uncertainties of future innovation. That's a real failure on our part. And so what we've done around that is to try to develop, and some of you will be familiar with it, something we call universal basic services. In other words, we are trying to develop a form of investment in people going forward, which says how can we do more with the finance we have to build up the, not just the physical infrastructures, but the social infrastructures that people will need to go through that process. And that isn't just health and education, although health and education are the fundament. They're already universal basic services we will take in the United Kingdom. But it's other kinds of things. So, for example, the way to think about that is move away from thinking about just getting people jobs and start thinking about what is their livelihood like, the context of their life, the quality of that livelihood. So here we already know, for example, that long commuting times are very closely connected with mental health problems. That's true in all the cities of the UK. We know that if you cannot get home quickly, if something happens to one of your children, this is hugely stressful. We know, for example, that the childcare arrangements are not in place. We know that very large numbers of people in the United Kingdom are caring for the elderly. We know we have done very little to invest in any of those care infrastructures, and we could do more, much more than we have done. How am I doing on time? Brilliant, so carry on. Well, <laughs> here's a bit of a push. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one more minute. One more minute. So, economic innovation, then social innovation, and then, of course, the innovation around governance and government, which is so crucial. There's a very strong connection between economics and politics, as you all know, and we have to rethink what that relationship is. So we have not just inequality in the United Kingdom, but a perception of a huge democratic, democratic deficit, a lack of voice on the part of our marginalized communities. And what's coming now, I think, with this shift in the way we're thinking about economics, is precisely what was mentioned earlier, and I'm sure Joe will talk about it more, which is a new form of co-production. But what does co-production mean? Well, I think one of the things it means is communities, local government, national government, civic organizations and universities in collaborative relationships which deliver together. Now, how have we done this? Well, we've done it in London through the London Prosperity Board. Emma's on the London Prosperity Board. This is a multi-stakeholder organization. It has the five boroughs that where we work on it, of course. It has uh, academics on it, universities. But it also has the London Legacy Development Corporation, the Office of National Statistics, Public Health England, Business in the Community, and a whole range of other <coughs> civic organisations. And why are they very important? They're important because the London Prosperity Board guided every step of the evidential work that we did to make sure that that evidence went immediately into action. Immediately into action. And so in the next phase of work that we will do, the work that we do, the research work we do, is being guided by evidence in action. And that means that everybody around the table can see how that evidence works for them, what, the, what that action is, what those outcomes could be, and how you deliver them. So thank you very much for inviting me, and I'm delighted to be here to follow a very brilliant conversation last night and another one this morning. Thank you so much. <laughs>
over a number of years now. Um, and I wanted to say a little bit about the kind of national economic perspective, um, a few words on why I think the place-based approach is so important, and then some of the opportunities that we can, we can do through um, local industrial strategy at the moment as well. <coughs> so national perspective. Um, the government published an industrial strategy at the end of 2017, um, and I think what's quite interesting is that there's a strong focus in that on productivity, but also an acknowledgement, speaking to some of the comments that have already been made, about the need for this to increase earning power uh, across the United Kingdom, that just driving after productivity, although we recognise the challenge, wouldn't be sufficient. And two areas I wanted to highlight from that industrial strategy, which I think provide a real opportunity for some of this thinking. Um, and a, a bit of a change in the way government really approaches economic policy. The first is an emphasis on grand challenges, which speak to some of the points already made about the potential disruption we're going to see. So government has highlighted the importance of artificial intelligence and data, the, the, the need to do more about an aging society, the need to address issues of, of clean growth, um, and also the importance of considering the future of mobility. And I think those grand challenges allow us to start to bring together different policy levers and think about some of our economic policies in a different way. The other important thing to highlight in the context of innovation is government has emphasised the need to increase the overall percentage of R&D investment in the economy um, of overall GDP. So at the moment, about 1.7% of GDP is made up of R&D. Government's aspiration is to move over the next decade to 2.4%. Um, obviously, that's an input, and I think it's the outputs that we're really interested in in terms of increasing both innovation and the inclusivity agenda. But what I think that provides us is a really interesting framework, because the debate now is how are we going to do that? Because we can't continue to do things in the same way if we're going to meet the 2.4% aspiration by increasing public and private investment, or if we're really going to address these grand challenges. So I think that's a real opportunity for people to shape over the next few years how we should, how we should do that collectively. And the second key area for me is the importance of a place-based approach. Um, I mean, the kind of the literature that Collins already referred to shows how, in a kind of global economy, actually the generation of ideas and networks and proximity is more important than ever. So the kind of very exciting things that are going on here, the knowledge culture, is the way that you know, people are increasingly innovating. It's not out of town science parks, it's coming into the city centre. And that gives us a real opportunity to think about things differently. <coughs> Liverpool, it has really high R&D intensity as part of the overall kind of GBA of the economy. A lot of that's based on the fantastic research assets in the university. So the challenge really is how to capitalise on them and make sure that local residents can really benefit. And Liverpool's got a fantastic location in, you know, the kind of across the Northern Powerhouse, some fantastic networks of research excellence and business excellence. And just in the northwest, looking over your borders to the kind of levels of uh, business R&D investment in, in Cheshire, for example. The other key element to the place-based agenda is I really, I've been working on this for a number of years now. I've kind of done versions of city deals, devolution deals. Um, I've worked with Liverpool on the International Festival for Business. And I actually think this is a really interesting moment where we've got a set of institutions and new powers but have really started to galvanise and come together in a different way. So we've got the City Council and wider councils, we've got the Mayoral Combined Authority with devolved powers, we've got the Local Enterprise Partnership and the universities. And for me, the kind of maturity of those relationships and the kind of institutional powers is really exciting because it's one of the first times we've really started to bring economic and social policy levers closer together and into debates like this. And I think what that allows us to do is to think a little bit differently about regeneration, which maybe historically was more about physical capital. We're now bringing intellectual capital in in the form of thinking about innovation and ideas. And I would say we've, we've also got opportunities to bring human capital and social capital into that as well. And that is exciting because we've often thought of those things in separate silos, but the ability to do that in a place-based way starts to not only bring the debate together, but the actual power in it, uh, to influence that too. And then from a government perspective, the way we're talking about doing this at the moment is through local industrial strategies. I think the idea of co-production is really critical. We really do want to start to move beyond the kind of deal-based approach to genuinely working in partnership, both across Whitehall and with, with my team, where we're leading the development of these local industrial strategies. I think importantly, we also don't want co-production to just be kind of government and locality. Um, I always think it's an interesting question to ask whose local industrial strategy is it. 
I don't think it should just be governments, nor do I think it should just be in a city, you know, the city region in terms of the institutional structure. If this local industrial strategy is going to work, it has to speak to the business community, to the third sector, and ultimately to the people of Liverpool. And I think that is the challenge for all of us as policymakers, because you know, these initiatives come. We've had umpteen local growth initiatives, and Michael could talk eloquently about all the different initiatives we've seen in Liverpool over 30 years. But the ones that work, and the ones that stick, are the ones that really work for the kind of people of the locality. And I think that is quite an important challenge for all of us at the moment to get right. And then I think the final thing for me is accepting that this is difficult and that we're all, this is a bit experimental. So I think the kind of thing for me on that is, first of all, we need to make sure we're getting the evidence of what's working and sharing that best practice, which is why things like this are brilliant. And I think we also need to be um, both kind of humble and honest in what we know and what we don't know about our economies. So I think actually having a conversation where we can say, these are our opportunities, these are our specialisms, but as we've already heard today, these are some really significant challenges we need to face as well, helps us move the debate on too. Thank you. Brilliant. Um, absolutely brilliant, and um, lots of very interesting things from all of our speakers there. Um, I just carried away, I think all three or four um, colleagues talked about the moment. Um, Henry had talked about a national moment, Colin talked about the moment of KQL, and Joe's just talked about a moment of change. So I think this is an opportunity because things are changing and we can't go on as it were. So less of me, uh, colleagues are terrific, they stuck the time, it means we have 10 minutes for comments and questions. I have two colleagues with microphones. What I'm going to do is ask for um, two or three hands. Not everyone will get a question or a comment, but I'll take uh, two or three of them and then come back to the panel. So can I have some hands, please? <coughs> and of course, if I don't see another, um, please, thank you. And simply say who you are and make your point, thanks. Um, I'm Andy Rose, I work for the Region, identified partnership and the Joint Coast with the NHS. Just as a question for Joe, but other people might want to pick it up. In terms of grand challenges, you, you outlined the, the four areas, but do you think we need a grand challenge around addressing inequality across the country? For me, that would be Okay, thank you. I'll hold that. Joe, that should be put on uh, notice there. That's an easy one. <laughs> now, as you know, I start, I know a lot of people in the audience, and if I don't get a hand, I'll point them. Please, at the back behind you, Rachel, thank you. Um, hi, my name is Dawn Payne. I'm the co founder of the Extraordinary Club. Um, question for Colin, really. I'm just quite curious about the kind of rallying cry concept of how we kind of catalyze our region's change makers. I'd be kind of interested to understand what that actually looks like in practice or whether it is more of a rallying cry at the moment. Thank you. There's a couple, I'm gonna take one more. And John Flanson, oh no, I've got, um, yes, of course, Bob from Single, who's actually Single doing a great job in the knowledge quarter and actually doing stuff on the ground. So please mm, tell thanks, us. Michael. Uh, Barry Roberts from uh, Morgan Sindel, um, the MD for the North. I suppose just a comment really, picking up on some of the reflections that we've had this morning about growth and, and inclusion, and inclusion coming first, rather than kind of one uh, step after the other. And uh, the good news is that everybody's doing some fantastic work uh, actually on the, on the field at the moment. So uh, you can see all the new shiny buildings kind of going up at the minute, but the, the really important thing is that. Uh, uh, we're using that as a catalyst to kind of change people's lives now and we're getting local people involved. We've got a, a concept, uh, it starts off as a place, I suppose, called the Knowledge Quad. And what that is all about is about le uh, linking learning with industry uh, and creating jobs for local people, but not just apprentices in, in Brick Lane and joinery and steel things. And of course, there's hundreds of them being created, but kind of linking in with the universities and the schools and local industry to create. Uh, jobs that will create prosperity for the future uh, and attracting and retaining the best talent to the city as well. You know, kind of making sure that the, the students that are coming here and having a good time on a Saturday night are kind of staying here to work in the future as well to create that prosperity as we move forward. And we've also been doing some fantastic things globally as well. We've had students from Germany and India and other places, haven't we, coming to see what fantastic things that we're doing and hopefully. Uh, spreading the word about what the city's doing in, in a fantastic way. 
Brilliant. Thank you for that positive note as well. Um, there's three. Um, Joe, do you want to go off on do we need a grand chance in equality and then call on change makers and um, we can come to that final question moment. Okay, so I think my answer to that is more, if I put the two together, so grand challenges and place-based, I'd suggest that that's the way to do it. So if you take something like the ageing society grand challenge and take a place-based approach to that, that allows you to maybe address some of the issues that kind of uh, Louise has already been raising. I think that works for potentially two reasons. One, the point that's already been made about in-region inequality. Uh, two, because of the scale you can operate. So was it about three million kind of data sets? So actually it's possibly a better level to work at. Um, and three, you can get the right people around the table. So I think, I take the point, I, I just, I'm slightly, one government set out before grand challenges, I might kind of work within them and work at a place-based way, but I genuinely think that's the right way to do some of this. Um, I think the other thing that's worth considering is there'll be kind of significant funding streams coming against those grand challenges. So I'd be encouraging you and others to think, well, how can we get hold of those and make them work for the, the city region? Thank you, Joe. Colin, um, change makers. Well, uh, some good news, Dawn. You're a change maker. So you are one of them. And um, I, I think what I, what I mean by that is people who are at the start of something, often without being asked to do it, to be there, quite often not for commercial gain, um, rather than people who we often talk about who are at the, maybe at the delivery end of the process, which is generally your ambassador program. And I think the role of ambassadors is important, and those advocates who sell what we're all doing. But I think change makers are the really interesting component in our society, and they can be from any area of life, any, anywhere, and they're kind of secretly amongst us all. Um, you know, people in media like Dawn, uh, in net, uh, media networking, Frank McKenna, um, people like John and Rebecca here, who without John and Rebecca, I wouldn't be doing half of what I'm currently doing in Liverpool and the Knowledge Quarter. People who are changing from whatever their role is and trying to do things to make places better and improve people's lives. I think there are architects and consultants. Paul from Arab. Paul doesn't just have a great time traveling the world, but he does so much completely and totally for free because he He's believes doing this passionately free, in making yeah. change. And that's what I mean really by that. So people who are at the start, the group of people who I'm proud to have been involved with who started the Liverpool brand work, where that will take us when that's launched come September, a whole new compelling brand narrative for Liverpool. So people who make a change, not for personal gain, but they believe in making places and people's lives better. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Henrietta, I know um, Barry's comment was, was a comment on the question of what they're doing. Um, how does that fit with um, what you're doing on the Local Prosperity Index and local, on the Global Prosperity Board? Tell us a little bit about institutional mechanism things you might think about. Uh, well, I was very interested in what you had to say, and, and I think here the, you know, the the role of business here is absolutely crucial. And I think we've done a number of things in collaboration with Emma uh, in the LLDC. But one of the things that we've also done, which has been very productive because it's drawn in smaller businesses, is created something called Fast Forward 2030, which is a group of young British millennial entrepreneurs who are dedicated to developing business models that will deliver on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And that means that keeping them close to the evidence base in the university produces a better quality of young entrepreneurs. So instead of just producing people through the university and then abandoning them, you stay close to them, which is what you're talking about, in the next phase of their development. And that means you get a better quality of entrepreneur, but it also means that when you're talking about you know, can we do something about plastics, which all young people want to do in the oceans? You know, can we do something about food insecurity? Can we do something about um, not needing to have uh, heating bills for the elderly because our insulation is so good in our houses, whatever it is, whatever it is, that they're able to develop, to deliver on that, precisely because they stay close to other businesses, but to the universities, to these multiple, multiple conversations is the key, I think. Thank you for that. Louise, do you, I know there wasn't a specific question. Do you, do you want to reflect on anything you've heard? Because I'm going to close the session down a moment or two, but just any thoughts of questions raised? You talk about fragmentation and 
governance and all of that. I mean, how well are we doing on that? What does the scale of the task involve? Because Knowledge Corp Loop was trying to pull things together in a place. And your description of our wider place, it is very fragmented. So what are we doing and what are you doing to kind of give a more coherent uh, focus to that? Um, well, Liverpool Health Partners um, have become the sort of virtual academic health science model uh, for Liverpool. Um, and we are making quite significant progress now in terms of moving some of the specialist trusts onto campus. Uh, Clatterbridge will be open, Liz, next year, yes, yes, next May. And that, for the first time, we'll have a clinical centre of excellence for cancer literally on campus where our, our cancer research is carried out. So we are making progress, but we're, we've still some way to go. Um, however, Liverpool Health Partners is a very strong brand. It's a virtual centre. Um, and will be instrumental in getting a BRC. And if we have a BRC, then we have an acad academic health science model and everyone benefits. Perfect, thank you. In fact, I kept from the, the answers and the questions, there's a huge amount of very good things going on which you should be very positive about. We don't have more time to spend on this theme. It'll run through the day, but can I please ask you to thank my colleagues, Jim <laughs>